Hey there, Touch Designer Programmers, Matthew here. So, continuing along in our series that is about uh, Python, specifically inside of Touch Designer, we're going to take a little bit of time here today to kind of pull apart references a little bit more. Now, I've talked about references a whole lot in several other places, and I'll put up some links for that. So I don't want to belabor that point too much, but I do want us to take some time to really suss out what it is that we're doing when we're making references with touch. Uh, and we can look at that a little bit more closely here uh, and look at some of the things that come along with that. So let's prep our workspace. We're going to go ahead and uh, get rid of all the stuff that's in here typically. And we don't need a text port yet, but there's a good chance that we might want to have it. And because we've been working with DAT so much, let's just go ahead and open that up. And I'm going to scoot it over to the side here, just so we've got it in case we need it. Okay, so uh, for those of you that haven't written any references before, references are how we connect operators of dissimilar families. So let's take a, a pretty simple example, right? Let's imagine that we have an LFO a low frequency oscillator, and this thing's job is just to kind of rock it back and forth uh, between negative one and one. Now, that's a little bit too steep for my likings right now, right? If I was to attach a trail chop here, we could kind of see what that looked like. And I want to adjust that slightly. Uh, I want to take that, I want to turn that down a little bit. I don't want that to happen quite so fast, so I want the curve of that animation to be a little bit slower, and I want my amplitude to be just about half of that. So we're only going to go from negative 0.5 to 0.5, positive 0.5. We'll see why in just one second. And trust me, I thought about this, I promise. So we can get rid of our trail chop. We don't need that here. Now let's imagine that we want to draw a circle. And so we can use our handy dandy circle top. And I happen to want this circle to drift from the left side of the screen to the right side of the screen. I want it to just move back and forth, right? First things first, I'm going to make it a little bit smaller. smaller. I'm going to do 0 0.05, 0 0.05 to just kind of crank that thing down a little bit. And what I want to do is I want to see this thing. I want it to move to the right and then to the left. To the right, to the left. Okay, well, how do I do that? Well, what we're going to do is we want to use this channel operator over here to drive that animation. And we're going to do that today by writing a reference. So the magic here, and in fact, I should go ahead and bring up my magnifier, because that's going to be real handy. Bear with me one second. All right, so I've got my magnifier up and running here. So we're going to write a little expression, and the expression we're going to write is going to reference what's happening over here in this channel operator in order to drive what's happening here with our cir circle. So we're going to go ahead and start off our reference, and the syntax of our sentence, or excuse me, the syntax of our reference uh, works the following way. First, we're going to specify that we're looking at an operator. And I'm doing that by using op, and then this open parentheses. And then inside of this, I'm using the string name of the operator. Now, remember, we learned what a string was last time around. And this string name, right, that's inside of here, corresponds over here to this puppy's name. So these are the things that need to match, right? So uh, you can, we can even see here that when I've highlighted this, we can see that it's being evaluated as a string LFO1. Now next up in square brackets, I'm similarly going to write another string, and this string corresponds to the channel that I want to have access to, Chan1. All right, so there I have it, right? Easy peasy. I've written my first expression here uh, that goes ahead and draws a kind of correlation or draws a relationship between center x and what's happening over here. Now, this doesn't have to be the only way that I can write this expression. So let's look at how oh, another way we might write this expression. Right? Another way that we might think about how we conceive of this thing is that we might think of the name of the operator and then rather than putting in the string name of our channel, we could put in the index of our channel. And in this case, the index is zero. Now, 
that might seem a little bit strange uh, if you're not accustomed to programming, thinking about an index being zero instead of being one. And that's because we tend to think about numbers in terms of quantities, right? That's one of the things that we tend to do really well. I've got one pen, I've got one dollar, I've got five pennies. We tend to think of things in quantities. But when we're working here uh, in most programming languages, what we're thinking about is we're thinking about position. So in this case, the index of this particular value is at the zero position, which happens to be the zero position over here. We might see that just as easily if we were to have a constant, right? And we might look here, right? We've got a whole list of values, right? Chan 1 and a value that's associated with it. And we can see here that it's in the zero position. That's a little bit kind of like wonky to get uh, kind of accustomed to, but we can think of that in some ways the same way we think about distance, right? If I'm one mile away from something, or one kilometer away from something, I'm still not there yet. I'm still one mile or one kilometer away. I haven't arrived to that particular thing until I am zero miles or zero kilometers away. Zero is a position, right? So similarly, Zero over here is a position in terms of how we think about the index value of these channels. If we were to, for example, add another channel here, chan two, right? So now we've got two channels in this particular operator. Now we can see that there's uh, index value zero and index value one. Now those are different right? The same way uh, that we might think of their names as being different. It's the same kind of thing as if we think of a uh, kind of row of school, school children headed out to the playground. In a line, they not only have a name, right? We might think of this as their name, but they also represent a position in that line. And this is our way of thinking of that in terms of position. Now, we'll talk more about this when we talk about dictionaries and lists and data types and data structures. But for right now, it's important to distinguish the fact that we have both access uh, to referencing uh, an operator or a channel in an operator by thinking either of its name or by thinking of its position. So let's look at a few other things here, right? We might. Also, while we're writing some expressions, we might decide that, you know what, I don't want that to drive uh, the x parameter, the center x parameter. Instead, I'd like that to drive the y parameter. So here again, uh, let's practice writing our expression, right? LFO1 and Chan1. All right, pretty swanky, that's great. We might also similarly think about, okay, well, that's all well and good. So what happens if I do it to both of these? Right, now I'm drawing a diagonal. Okay, what happens then if I take one of these and I ask for the opposite value, right? Negative really being the opposite value, right? Then I get something that moves the other way. Okay, well, then what happens if both values are the opposite? Right? We can begin to see how uh, we might manipulate our reference in a way that's going to change the way that it's expressed. Right, That's part of what we're getting at here. Now, we could even be a little bit crazier if we wanted to. We could push that a little bit further. So let's look at how else we might think about some of that. Okay, so in this case, we're going to go ahead and we're going to use our good friend, a constant chunk and then we're going to use a speed chop. A speed chop is going to increase at the rate that's fed to it. So if we feed our speed chop here with our constant and we give it a value of 1, we'll see that it's just going to increase steadily and it will increase steadily forever. That's great. That's exactly what we want it to do today. So we're going to do the same thing. We're going to borrow one of these circle chops, or circle tops, excuse me. And we'll just clear out our expression here and return it to zero as a position. Now, let's think about what we might do if we wanted to, say, draw a circle. 
Let's say that we want the path of this thing to move in a circle around here inside of this particular pixel region. Okay, well, how might we do that? If we were going to do that just with math, right, uh, then we'd think about taking, and in fact, we could even, if we felt like it, we could do a little bit of Googling. So let's do a little bit of Googling, and let's draw a circle with math. All right, and there we can see right away, right, this will take us all the way back to a little bit of trigonometry and geometry. And we can see that uh, if we take R, or excuse me, if we uh, think about the fact that we want to um, use the cosine and sine of theta, and we need to know the radius of the thing that's involved, that's the way that we're going to kind of get at this, right? Okay. So with that in mind, I don't know what that means. Okay, that's, that's all right. We can kind of tackle this, right? So let's go ahead and let's start by just putting in our reference first. So we happen to want speed one, and as speed one, we know that we want chan one, and sure as shooting, that's far away. That's zoomed way over here. Okay, so far so good. Now. Let's start with math. So we're going to use math.sign. So we're going to use the sign operation that happens to be in the math module. So we'll use that. Okay. Well, that's that's something. All right. It's it's going over here and it's coming back. Okay. Part of what we're still missing in this equation though is we're missing the radius of the circle. Right? So if we use something like 0 0.4, now we've got a radius. Well, that, that still doesn't look quite like a circle, and that's partially because we're only drawing a portion of that wave, right? We're only drawing a part of that particular translation. So let's go ahead and borrow this uh, same expression, and instead of using the sine, we're going to use cosine. And now we can see that there we're drawing a circle with a circle, circleception. Okay, that's lovely, that's wonderful. Right, and we could decide if um, what kind of order of operations we wanted to do that in. We might also decide that, you know what, rather than a circle, I'd like to draw an ellipse. So if I want to draw an ellipse, right, I just need uh, an unequal value in terms of the radius of, of the circle that I'm trying to draw. And similarly, we could use the same kind of idea, right? here and let's just reverse those numbers and now we can see that we're drawing a tall ellipse versus a wide ellipse. Right, and the benefit here in terms of this particular approach means that by writing this expression right here inside of uh, our parameter, we're not actually having to think about using a math chop or using some other math outside of the actual expression itself. We're driving it right here inside of the expression field. Okay, well, let's look at another situation, right? So we're going to go ahead and borrow these guys. We'll bring them right over here. Uh, we're going to take our circle top. We're going to reuse that as well. We see this nice dotted line that tells us that it's still referencing our speed over here, and we're going to change that. So we'll change that to speed 2 and speed 2. Now, this time around, rather than being a situation where I have to hard code this value, what if I wanted to change this value over here in my constant? Right, so in this case, uh, we might have something called rate, and then we might also have something called radius. Now, we've broken our uh, expressions over here, right, because we've changed the name of the thing. That's okay. So we'll open this up so we can fix this a little bit. So first, we're going to look at rate. And now, instead of multiplying by not 0.4, what we're going to do is we're going to look again at our operator called speed2. And this time around, we're going to look at radius as a channel. Now, with any luck, we're going to see it not move at all. And that's because our radius is zero. So if we take that value and we start to make it larger, we'll see now we're starting to draw a circle. 
Oh, and we're connected to our speed shop. Ah, brilliant. That's great. So what's happening here, right, is that our speed is kind of carrying on right away, and we don't want this thing to actually reference the speed chop. We want it to reference our constant over here. So let's fix that. So rather than speed, we're going to look at constant 2, right? Constant 2. And again, we'll kind of move this up over here so we can see that we're actually referencing two different operators. In one case, we want to uh, use rate to consistently and forever drive the spinning of this thing, right? And at the same time, I want to have a static number that's standing in for the radius of the circle that I'm drawing. So that's why I'm referencing these two different operators. Now, let's look at another way that we might write that same expression. We might write that same expression by using index values instead of using our names. So rate over here looks like it's in the zero position. Now radius, on the other hand, is in the one position. So let's go ahead and put one in here. Okay, so far, so good. That's looking pretty swanky so far. Now, what about the circumstance that I had back over here, right, where I've got two different radius values that I'm using? All right, well, let's go ahead and let's change this. Now we can see here at, at a glance, right, so while the, changing the name of our channel broke our expression in one case, that didn't break in the other case. And that's because over here, we're relying on an index rather than relying on a name. So in this case, if we change the name, we also have to change our expression to keep it from breaking. All right, so let's look at the circumstance where now we want to draw an ellipse rather than drawing a circle. Now in this case, I'm going to look at constant 2, and I want to look at radius 2. Right, so I've got radius 1 and radius 2, and that looks like it's not doing anything yet because, sure enough, I've got to turn up that radius value a little bit. And now I can see I'm drawing an ellipse. Let's practice while we're here. And let's do the same thing, where instead of using our names, we use our index values. So that would mean that radius 1, that's in the 1 position, right? That's in the 1 position, 0, 1, 2, and radius 2 is in the 2 position. Lovely. Now we could imagine a circumstance where we could take these guys, and if we didn't want to draw a long ellipse, but we want to draw a tall ellipse, then in one case, well let's do these in the same order, right? So here, we're going to use radius 2 on the top, radius 1 on the bottom, and in this case, we're just going to swap our index values. So that's one way that we might think about how we're going to draw this particular ellipse. Now, in this case, what we're doing is we're using a constant and a speed to make all of that happen. And in fact, we can do this another way as well. We're going to go ahead and borrow one of these circle uh, tops. We'll bring it down over here. And we're going to go ahead and put in a table dat. And in our table that, we're going to go ahead and give it some exact dimensions. We're going to make it 2 by 2. Radius 1. Radius 2. Not 0.4. Not 0.25. So let's start first by drawing a circle. That's what we're going to start by doing. Now, uh, our expressions here, we need to kind of take a little bit of a deviation in terms of how we're uh, going to write them. So the first thing that we need is we first need a value that increases forever. In this case, we're going to use abs time dot seconds. Now, let's go ahead and grab an eval dot here. 
And we can evaluate that expression so we can just kind of see what it's doing without actually having to put it inside of a parameter. Here we're going to go ahead and write that same expression, abs time dot seconds. And here we can see that we've got a float value that is increasing forever. We also have, happen to have access to abs time dot frame. That's a frame count, right, that increases steadily. Now, if we didn't do abs time, we could do me dot time. And me dot time is going to be linked to the timeline down here, just like frame is going to be linked to the timeline as well. So our frame we're going to see, we'll see that recycle at 600 frames. As seconds, we'd see it recycle at 600 seconds, or excuse me, at um, 10 seconds. And I don't want that. I just want this value to keep going and going and going. So in this case, I'm going to use abs time dot seconds. Perfect. Now, here, the next thing I want to reference, right, the next thing I want to point to is this value radius 1. And I don't want to grab it from constant 2. I want to grab it from this table. So let's practice by writing our reference here first. So we might imagine that we want the operator table 1. And now what do I do? Well, I've got to give my, in my reference here, I need to use a set of coordinates. And I need to use a set of coordinates where I'm looking at the row and then the column. And I can see over here, I've got nice little uh, handy reminders to point out what the position, right, what the index value of my rows and columns are. So if I was to put in 0, comma 0 as the position in that array that I'm grabbing from, I can see that I'm actually grabbing from radius 1. Now, if I was to want to say grab 0 0.4, I can see that I want to be in row 0, but column 1. So I want to be in row 0 and column 1. Now, as it turns out, I can write this expression a number of ways. I can write this expression by using headers as reference points or by using index values. In this case, I don't have a header that corresponds to what's going on here uh, above this particular row. So I need to use a row number to indicate what I'm looking at. Or excuse me, I need to indicate use a column number to indicate which column I'm looking at. But I could give this a row name, radius 1, for example. So in this case, I'm saying find the row radius 1 which matches over here, and then give me the contents of column 1 right here. So that's part of the way that we can understand how this expression is working. So I can just go ahead and copy this expression, and let's put it right over here. So we're going to substitute that in instead of using our constant. And in fact, we can take the same expression that we've written and again, we need to remember that we want cosine. And now, sure as shooting, we're drawing another circle. Now maybe we want to draw an ellipse again. So now, instead of radius 1, I want to use radius 2. And now I'm back to drawing an ellipse. And maybe I don't want to draw a wide ellipse. I want to draw a tall ellipse. Radius 2 and radius 1. So these are all ways that I can use these expressions to get access to what's happening inside of other operators, right? So I'm calling this an expression, right? Because this is actually a, a way that I'm kind of uh, parsing out some uh, Python. I'm actually uh, using that to find something. And it's referencing another operator. So you'll hear those kind of in concert quite frequently. Now, of course, there is an easier way to do all of that as well. Um, as many of you know, right? So if we had another operator here, one way that we might get to those rather than writing them all out is we can, uh, actually not in the case of dats, but in the case of chops up here, we might go ahead and grab one of these values just by making our speed viewer active, grabbing the channel that we want, 
and dragging it to the parameter where we want it assigned, and then choosing relative chop reference. Now the problem that we have here is that we still need to write all the extra mathematics in order to get the thing that we want. So that doesn't necessarily help us when we're writing a more complex expression, but that is a way, if you want to see the syntax of how you're referencing something, that you can get access to it. Okay, let's look at another example. So in this case, we're going to go ahead and uh, we'll use a folder, dat, and we're going to change a few things here. So we can see here that this is actually uh, using an expression itself, and we're going to swap in for a different one. So I actually want to use this bad boy, app.samples folder plus slash map. And what that's going to do is that's going to point me at the samples folder, right? If we had a movie file in top, we might see that this is in fact an expression. And if we were to look at what that expression was, aha, app.samples folder plus slash map slash banana dot tip. Now we can begin to see that what we've got here is we've got a string and we um, could probably deduce that this app.samples folder is also going to return a string. And in fact, if we highlight it and hover over it, we can see that sure enough, it returns a string. So in order to grab this, all I did was I just grabbed this portion of what we've got here, copied it, pasted it over here, and then thoughtfully remembered to add the second uh, tick mark so that we had an actual path. If we don't have that tick mark, we'll get an error. And that's just because we've got this open string. We've got to close that string. Let's make sure we can grab that. Oh, bother. There we go. I don't know why I was misbehaving. Okay. So, well, let's think about how we can point at something or grab something from this folder. Okay, let's go ahead and let's make sure that we have our path because we're going to need a path to get to something. We can turn off a bunch of these other things. So now we've just got our name and a path. Excellent. Now, let's say that instead of this business, we want to write an expression that points to one of these specifically. So we know how to do this. We can start our expression, right? Folder one is the operator that I'm looking for. And in folder one, I can specify the row and column. So I might want three over here as the row and one as the column. And I can go ahead and make sure that I've got an expression that I'm using here. Now, we could write that as well, rather than three, one, we might say, you know what, I want path. That's the column I want you to look at, right? That's the header. Or we could say, you know what, let's actually use this one. What's this thing named? It's named uh, Messler. So we could say, you know what, I want metler.1.jpg. Oops. Metler3. Aha, see? There you go. That's why this can get you in trouble. Or I could even say, you know what? What I want is Metler3, and I want you to look in the column called path. Right? So we've got lots of ways that we can evaluate what that particular thing is. And you might be saying to me, Matt, that's great, but which one's right? And I would say, oh, dear Gosling, the one that's right is the one that's right for the project, right? Depending on what you're doing, any one of these might be the right solution to the problem that you have. And I can't tell you which one is the correct one. It's really a matter of kind of uh, sussing out what's right for your particular project and your particular needs. Okay, so what else might we look at? The last thing that I want us to look at here today that's going to be really useful for us to think about is uh, with a movie file in. And one of the things that is tremendously powerful here 
uh, with Python is understanding what this Python help button does and then learning how to actually read the documentation that's associated with it. And that's like, I know that can be a little bit intimidating and it's a little bit scary for all of us when we get started, but I believe in us, we can do it. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to drop in our movie file in, we're going to add a table, and then we're also going to add an eval dat. Now we just played with our eval dat, and this time by feeding it a table, what we're actually going to do is we can actually write lots of expressions that are going to be evaluated. Now we're going to write expressions here, so we can't do something like this, right? If we were to write a string and we didn't enclose it in parentheses, we don't know what that is. Movie is not defined. Well, what does that mean? That means that uh, if we think back to what we were doing last time around, movie is looking as though it were a variable. It looks like a Python variable. And uh, Touch is very handily telling us, yeah, I, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know what that is. You never told me, and I, I just, I don't know. I don't know. Help. So if we go ahead and put that in quotation marks, now we're just evaluating that as a string. And so we know, oh, that's not actually anything special, that's just a string, and I'm just going to display a string. So that's going to be useful for us to know here. Okay, so what are we going to do? We're going to take our movie file in, we are going to hit this magic show me all the goodies button, and we are now going to look at what goes on inside of this movie file top class page. How do I read this? Well, there's a lot of things that's in here, right? We see this thing called members. We see this thing methods. I got a top class. I got methods. I got an op class. goodness, gobbledygook is what it looks like. Well, we might uh, think about the fact that we have access to all of these things as long as we know the secret about how to get at them, right? So let's look and practice. Um, what some of that might mean and be. We're going to go ahead and just do a little bit of snapping. Wink. And we want this bad boy over here. Excellent. We're going to go ahead and close this for right now. Let's insert another row. We're going to add one below. And we're also going to add one uh, after, right? Okay, so what's this file height business? Let's start. We're going to make ourselves a little chart. File height. What's that mean? Well, let's write an expression to figure that out. So we want to look at the operator, and you know, sure enough, we clicked on this thing called a movie file, right? And this is in reference to a movie file. So let's let's see what that is. So we're going to look at movie file in five. I think is what this guy is. Yep. And here on this page, we're going to look at what's this what's this file height business? Okay, this is the height of the movie in pixels. So over here, let's use dot file height. Aha! So this expression, right, is returning, right, it's giving back to us the file height of this particular file in question here. Okay, well, let's look at another one. What about width? This thing's got a file width. All right, well, let's just, uh, we can go ahead and copy this. Let's paste this down here, and let's change this to width instead. Aha, there we can see our width. Okay, that's pretty, pretty swanking. So when we're reading this help page, right, these members, right, the members that exist here for the movie file in top class, are in reference specifically to the movie file in top. Just the movie file in top. But we also have these things that are members of the top class. And these happen to be things that exist for all tops. If you're top, you've got a thing called width. You've got a thing called height. You've got a thing called aspect width. All right, well, let's try that out. Let's see if that's true. Okay. Uh, just good old-fashioned width. So now I want the operator movie file in 5 dot width. Sure enough, that works. Okay, well then what about my op class, right? Because if we were, we're working backwards, we can see that, well, uh, 
my top is an operator, okay, so if it is an operator, uh, what are the things that I might have access to? I might have access to maybe something like, uh, let's look at its name, right? So uh, we want the name of our operator movie file in five dot name. Okay, well, now I know its name. Okay, well, uh, what about digits? We happen to know that we use digits an awful lot. We've seen that lots of places. Digits. Okay, digits. That happens to be in reference to this number down here. Okay, well, and I, now I can see that I've got access to all sorts of information, right? So the kind of secret to knowing how to read the documentation page is understanding what it means when we see that something is a member of a class, right? And understanding the kind of hierarchy of this. We might even see down here, all right, so let's look at maybe uh, cook time. Hmm, I haven't actually used cook time before. So let's, uh, let's see what that tells us. I would suspect that it's gonna tell us the cook time. Oh, all right. Oh, we need a capital T. All right, well, it tells us the cook time for this thing. All right, well, what about this type business? Uh, what about here? Uh, is it a top? Let's find out is top. Let's add below. Let's look at another one of these. Is top. Is this a top? It is. Okay, well, is it, uh, what about is dad? Is it a dad? Oh, it's not. Right, and we can recognize over here that we have integers, we've got strings, we've got floats, and we've got booleans. All things that we learned about, right? So understanding what all of these, uh, this dot business is about helps us understand what we can actually get out of something like our movie file in. And in fact, uh, if we look at any of our operators that have got one of these little question marks, uh, it tells us all sorts of information about what those things are, right? Oh, so I have an input cell, an input row, an input column. Uh, I know that I can export. I've got all of these other businesses about running, right? So now we have a way to kind of start to begin uh, to learn how to decode what these help documents are for and how we might uh, learn to use them and read them a little bit more efficiently. Okay, so that's the, the kind of bread and potatoes of, uh, bread and potatoes, <laughs> meat and potatoes of what's going on here. If you want to see a fuller example of all of this, there's another example file up on GitHub. I encourage you to take a close look at that to kind of explore what some of these mean. And most importantly, what you should do is you should explore. You should try out some of these things, right? Go ahead and type them all in. Practice. Look at them all. Start to think about, all right, well, what would that be good for? My, why might I want to know about if it's open or if it's opening or if it's preloaded? Why would I want to know what its rate is or if it's started or its index? Right, because having access to those is just part of it. But knowing that you can actually use that information in some interesting or novel or creative way, that is uh, really what gets at why Python is really useful and powerful for us, especially as we start to think about what to do with scripting. All right. Happy programming, everybody. And we will talk some more Python later on.